Hey, friends, welcome to the best podcast for nonfiction writers. I'm Stephanie Chandler, founder and CEO of the Nonfiction Authors Association. And I'm Carla King, host of the Nonfiction Authors Podcast. Stephanie and I would like to tell you a little bit about the association before we go on to this week's episode. If you're new to us, please stop by our website and check out our many member benefits, including a curated media list sent to your inbox every week. A monthly gathering on Zoom where members discuss their challenges and find answers. We have a massive content database with checklists, templates, reports, event recordings, and so much more. We also have a private Facebook group to stay connected with fellow members and publishing industry pros. We have a Meet the Members program where you can share your book announcements and get featured in our blog. Plus, we have discounts off our annual Nonfiction Writers Conference, an event held entirely online since 2010. We offer master courses and industry certification programs and a year-round book awards program. And finally, we have discounts with our awesome partners, including Lulu, Ingram Spark, Office Depot, and many more. Our community is the only place where nonfiction writers get the support needed to navigate the complex and often overwhelming world of book publishing. You can learn more about us over at nonfictionauthorsassociation.com. And I hope to see you in our community soon. Thanks, Stephanie. And here's our podcast. Today's session is our monthly replay from the archives. Today's session is with Edie Jerilim, and we're going to be talking about how to host your own book tour. I'm your host, Stephanie Chandler. Always appreciate you spending time with us. Edie Jerilim was a guidebook editor at Random House and Simon & Schuster in New York and and rough guides in London before moving to Tucson, Arizona and becoming a freelance writer. She's the author of four travel guides, including Arizona for Dummies and Frommer's Easy Guide to San Antonio and Austin, as well as one dog guide, Am I boring my dog and 99 other things your dog wishes you knew her articles have appeared in national geographic traveler the wall street journal travel and leisure and usa today.com among other national outlets publishers weekly said of her recent memoir getting naked for money an accidental travel writer reveals all Jerilyn's wicked sense of humor coupled with her insider's perspective add a fresh spin to this travel memoir. Hey, Edie, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Well, since we scheduled this webinar or this interview, um, the world has changed quite a bit. So we are going to talk about virtual book tours uh, shortly, but I wanted to start by talking about how you conducted your own successful book tour, because the reality is that eventually the world is going to resume business as usual, and this is probably a good time for authors to be planning and thinking about their future book tours. So how about starting by telling us about your own book successful book tour? Well, Everything is always a leap of faith, I, I say so, you know, when it comes to bookstores and authors and, and a lot of work. So this is a good time to plan a tour and hope that things will change sooner or later, um, hopefully sooner rather than later. But um, as you said, it's it's all about planning. So a lot of us have a lot more time at home uh, than we did, So um, and a lot of time online. And... Since you're going to be financing this tour yourself, um, and that has very little to do with the fact that it's an indie book necessarily uh, because very few publishers plan book tours anymore, you're going to have to figure out where it makes the most sense for you to go based on economics. And that includes not only transportation costs, but also the places that are likely to give you the best return on your dollar. And so since... My tour was to promote a memoir about my life as a travel writer, and I live in Tucson. Um, The longest leg that I planned was a road trip to Texas. And so I chose cities that were based on the travel books that I wrote and talked about in my memoir, um, including Arizona for Dummies and Fromer San Antonio and Austin. So I mapped out a route that included northern Arizona, Albuquerque, where I knew several people, and Las Cruces, where I had a travel connection, and then San Antonio and Austin. So you also need to 
study a bookstore's calendar and see if any dates you might want are already taken and if there are any major holidays you want to avoid. We'll talk a little more about all these details, but all in all, it's like an elaborate jigsaw puzzle. Sometimes you have to change dates or hustle to the next bookstores, depending on what you're able to secure. So a lot of planning, a lot of following up, and um, a lot of marketing. <laughs> a lot of marketing, yeah. How many stores did you end up hitting on your tour? Well, let's see. Um, now I have to go back and count them. I want to say a total of eight. Um, let's see. One in Arizona, two in New Mexico, uh, two in Texas, and then I had a second tour where I went to Minneapolis and St. Paul, and that's two more, but I think that's only seven. <laughs> so, um, I, um, yeah, but anyway, I, um, I paced it so I could, I took part of it with a friend, um, to share some of the driving because if you know the geography, there are long distances in Texas and New Mexico and Arizona. So I did part of that, um, just designed as a road trip and gave myself a little time to enjoy myself. So, you know, I, I don't think people are going to make a lot of money on book tours, um, but I think for me, it just inspired an amount of confidence that I could do this and, you know, also publicize my book because even if people didn't show up to the book tour, they became aware that I was doing it and aware of my book. Well, and that's a really great point, Edie, because, you know, just you may not get a huge turnout at the actual event itself. However, your tour has been promoted to that store's audience, right? Exactly. So you never know what kind of sales that's leading to. Um, Right. And and I also noticed you're a fan of indie bookstores, which I am as well because I happen to be a former bookstore owner. So I love that you um, support indie stores. How did indies factor into your tour? Well, I think it's important for a lot of reasons, including, of course, that you want to support your local bookstores, but um, indie bookstores are great at promoting their events. They have dedicated followings and email lists, and most of them are great at social media. Um, And also, you can find out who the owner is or the manager, um, and it's far easier to, in that sense, to find out who's doing the bookings um, and get a personal correspondence with them going. If you're going with the chains, you know, there's so many events and there are so many levels of bureaucracy to go through. So, um, you know, it's I, I think it's better on all counts. I did have a very nice reading at the Barnes & Noble in Las Cruces, I, I should say. Um, it's, a, it's at the university and it was, you know, kind of a... Uh, a local bookstore, in a sense, also, and so um, I, I wouldn't eliminate that as a possibility. But for the most part, I, I found it was far easier and more desirable to to go with the indie bookstores. And you mentioned doing a reading. So was that part of your tour? You would show up at the stores and actually do a reading of your book. I did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, that was the main part. Was was the reading, and there was a question period, but. But mostly it was, um, I guess it was about um, 20 minutes, maybe a little bit longer. And did you find while you were reading that other browsers in the store were wandering over to see what was going on? You know, most of the stores were pretty small. So um, it was the focus anyway of, of the event, and they had chairs set up. Um, but I, I do think a couple of people wandered over, but in my experience, people were shy. Um, they, sometimes they lurked in the back, but it was kind of like, I don't, I don't know what's happening here. Am I, am I supposed to come in? So I didn't find that as much as I would have expected or possibly hoped for. That's interesting. So how far in advance should authors be contacting bookstores about pitching a tour? I'd say at least three months. I started in mid-February, late February for an event that um, 
was mid June, so um, and February is a pretty quiet time, so it was a good time for me to start the planning and um, because I wanted especially because I wanted to do it at a time that was going to book up fast in the summer. So um, I wanted to make sure that the calendars were not booked up for the events. And then, so what actually goes into the pitch when you're reaching out to these stores? Well, I included um, an up-to-date press release, a picture of my book cover, and Um, Since I assumed that my press release might not be opened, um, I included a few blurbs and a link to Amazon where I have many five-star reviews. Um, And then I personalized it to the event. I focused on the dates that I was requesting. Um, In my case, I emphasized that since it was a humorous memoir about travel, my book was a great summer vacation read. And so it would be perfect for a summer event. And then I leveraged ties to individual stores and cities, for example, because I had been, I was the author of Fromer's San Antonio and Austin. I promised potential hosts in both cities that I'd be offering their audience behind the scenes information about writing that guidebook. So basically, to break it down, a general pitch for your book plus a tie into the city that you're visiting and to the time you want to visit, whether that's a season or an event. And uh, you might also research the bookstore and see if they had a successful event that you might tie your own event into, your own book into. And I'm also thinking that maybe if you've got an audience there or connections there that you could also mention that you'd be willing, you'll be promoting it to your audience as well. Is that helpful? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks for mentioning that. Um, I did, I did talk to people that I knew well because I had done, um, such extensive work in San Antonio and Austin. I knew a lot of people in the city and, um, worked with a lot of people so I could promise them an audience of, of people that I worked with and became friendly with over the years. Excellent. And then how about book sales at these stores? Did the stores order copies in advance? Were you expected to bring copies? Was it a combination of the two? Combination of the two. Well, individual, um, I was, some of them expected me to send books along in advance. Some of them expected me to bring books with me. And some of them, well, only one, and that was the Barnes & Noble, um, actually ordered books for me. And some of them kept books to sell on consignment. Um, and some of them said, bye. <laughs> it's been nice. <laughs> and uh, no, I mean, it wasn't quite like that, but um, it was... I, I'm going to say, and I, I'm going to be honest here, that very few paid me directly, um, and it was sometimes hard wrangling the money for the sales that um, from the book uh, out of the booksellers. It took me a long time and a lot of reminders in some cases. Is that so right? That was, yeah, I was I was surprised and frustrated. There were, I think, two that paid immediately. Um, with a check or cash based on the sales at the bookstore. Um, And others said, you know, they had to deal with the accounting, and I understood that, but um, it was was harder than I would have anticipated to to get a few of them to, to follow up with me. Oh, well, that's a headache. Yeah, I know. I wasn't going to say it, and then I thought, you know, um, other people might encounter that, and they should know, and maybe talk to people in advance and ask them, so how is this going to go? Because you have a contract, and as I say, most of them did take some books on on consignment, so um, it's fair to ask if you sell books, when are you going to get paid, when can you expect it, and, you know, possibly get that in writing too and be prepared with an invoice right at this at at the day of the signing so that you can hand them the invoice with probably maybe a 30-day term or something and then make note of following up on that (laughs) that's a good tip (laughs) (laughs) yeah 
Um, you also did a really creative tour around your dog and you partnered with some rescue organizations. Tell us about that. Well, it was funny because I was planning, you know, sort of a conventional book tour. And, you know, I do a lot of social media and I have a very cute dog who features in a lot of social media. And my previous book, is, as you mentioned, was a book called Am I Boring My Dog? And I had a lot of people um, who bought that book and who followed my dog blog, which I created to promote that book. So I had a natural audience in the um, dog blogging and just dog owning pet community. And I continued, you know, even afterwards to have strong ties with rescue organizations promoting rescue. So, um, and it just happened that at the same time, I saw this cartoon um, that had a picture of a man, an author sitting in a bookstore forlornly with no one lined up to see him. And next to him at the same table is a large dog with all these people lined up to see the dog. (laughs) I've seen that cartoon and it is, it is hilarious. (laughs) So I was inspired to do my own, the author and her dog book tour. And I did, I hired somebody. And that's one thing that I have to say that I have noticed over and over again, find talented people to help you because I, I just found this guy um, who did, a version of that cartoon with me and my dog sitting at the table. And for each of the stops, I had, um, you know, a sign. The cartoon was um, was tailored to that particular event. And so you had the cartoon, you had me and, and the dog, and you had um, the time of the event and the bookstore and the date. And so that was fun. And so it was a natural tie-in to see if I could, get rescue organizations on board and I would donate a portion of uh, the proceeds and um, it didn't work out in some cases in many cases but I had a wonderful promotion with the San Antonio um, Humane Society and because of that promotion I I got on um, morning television and with my dog and talking about rescue and talking about my my book signing, so um, and there was a pet friendly hotel in in Austin that it worked out for too. That you know they promoted on their social media, and I talked about the hotel and I blogged about it. So it it was um, it was fun, and of course I had my dog with me, and uh, she was a great hit because more people. Well, I won't say more people came to see her, but a lot of people came to see her. That's such a cute idea. You can never go wrong with a dog. <laughs> that is so you can cute. never go wrong with a dog. Oh, I love if, that. If your dog is if your dog is friendly. If your dog is not friendly, you could go really well, wrong. You could go really wrong. That's true. <laughs> so and that leads in nicely to my next question about how to promote the tour. I mean, obviously getting local television news coverage is, is great. So did you pitch them yourself or was that something that happened because of the promotion? How did that end up happening? I pitched, I pitched every, I mean, it was really, I do it yourself from beginning to end. And um, so I, I tried to get local newspapers interested um, on the basis of the book, um, on the basis of the promotion. Um, it wasn't the most successful thing I did, but I, I did get a, um, a local newspaper in, um, in Prescott, Arizona interested and I, um, you know, I, I got on websites more than I, I got on newspapers um, radar. So that was good. And, you know, mostly I did my own social media um, on my blog. Well, I have three blogs, two of which are relevant, one, the one about dogs and my name blog, edgerolam.com. And I then, you know, I have Twitter, I have Facebook. So... Um, you know, it was it was pretty much a combination of of all of those things, and just keeping it friendly and light, so they didn't feel like you were, um, you know, barraging them. And marketing is hard; it's a fine line between, you know, being obnoxious and and being fun and just keeping yourself in 
other people's imagination and uh, radar. So, um, you know, I think we all have a problem with that. But um, that's why having something creative and fun uh, is is a way to go that, um, well, the book is fun to begin with, and then having various things around it that remind people that you're doing fun stuff is, is going to help out. Absolutely. And I think that's a big lesson here that it, you know, it's not all about how many people show up to the actual signing, but you're reaching more people because you've created this event and a reason to promote it and a reason for people to talk about it. So I think there's a, there's value in that, that side of it. That makes a lot of sense to me. Absolutely. So, I mean, now that we're talking about it, um, even talking about book tours now is a good thing because here people can talk about their books and the tour that they're planning and you know it's a great hook for for the future and you know um a a way to think about things that um is not necessarily focused on the present which a lot of us are having a lot of trouble focusing on yeah absolutely it's a crazy time so Edie, you've got some experience with virtual book tours too tell us about that well, you know, I honestly didn't, well, I won't say I didn't do that much because I created a Kickstarter which had its own virtual presence. So um, it wasn't a book tour, obviously, um, but it was a way to to get people involved in my book in, in advance and um, literally to make advance sales. And I did go on other people's virtual book tours, however. And there were two ways to do that. Um, One is to pick the subject matter that you are um, writing about and get other bloggers in that field or other influencers, I guess. Um, Now is more relevant. It wasn't at the time, but other influencers in that field to promote your book. And conversely, there are also sites that are dedicated to promoting books of all genres. So um, that's another way to do it. And some of those cost money. Um, So I think it's better to get people who are in your field, um, send them, offer to send them books and do a a blogging tour. So in my field, it was... um, it was dogs. I, I didn't do that because I created the blog to promote the dog book after the fact, but I I was part of a lot of dog blogging tours after that, and you just, you know, people would all agree on one particular day to basically bombard the media with um, talking about your book on that particular day. Wow. That's great. And, you know, on the Kickstarter, I've got to ask, so Kickstarter is a crowdfunding platform. It's a place where you can potentially raise money for your book campaign, um, but you have to give something away to people who fund your Kickstarter campaign. So were you just doing bulk copies of your book or were you getting creative and having some other um, oh, I items did a lot that people of different things. Yeah, I mean, mostly it was books, um, signed copies of books, and you know, mentioning people in the books and things like that. Um, and there were different versions of the book on different levels. But I also offered to create a tour of um, different places that people lived, and um, I did. I did bring in my other blog, which was genealogy at that time. Um, for the Kickstarter, I, I write about Vienna because that's where my family was from, so I offered virtual tours of Freud's Vienna. Um, well, I should backtrack for a second. Freud's Vienna because my great uncle was Sigmund Freud's butcher in Vienna. So my other genealogy blog is Freud's Butcher. So I, I, I brought in everything. I mean, I guess this is the moral of the story that people should take away. Bring in whatever you've got. <laughs> Just, you know, think about other people's interests, your interests, and um, just be creative about this all. If, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. I mean, the hardest thing about the Kickstarter was being on every single day. Um, but I did it. You know, I woke up in the morning. I said, this is my job. 
I'm going to raise money for this book, and and it it happened. People kept, and when people said, "Oh, you can never raise money for a book," you know, that's that's not what Kickstarter is for. I said, "You'll see." <laughs> <laughs> I'm perverse. The more people who said, "I don't think you could do that," the more I said, "Oh, yeah." Good so. for you. I love that. And you're also a great example of an author who's got. Um, you know, interest in multiple genres. You've got your dog blog and your travel and your genealogy. And I get this question a lot, you know, can I blend my um, multiple interests together? And oftentimes the answer is no, and they have to be kind of separate blogs or separate platforms. And it sounds like, you know, you're finding opportunities when you can to weave them together, but you also understand that they have to be separated, right? Right. Yes, they are. I mean, I'm going to get people on my genealogy blog that I'm not going to get on my dog blog. But I, um, and, you know, my edgerolam.com blog is is going to be um, the the link between all of them because I'll tell people what I'm I'm doing on all of them and also talk more about writing in general and and the Kickstarter. Um, But I I don't think you have to put yourself in a box either. You can, you don't have to say, um, and I think this is where the nonfiction writer has an advantage. You don't have to say, I'm going to only write certain characters and have a certain setting like many fiction writers end up doing. And that's great. I love series novels and series mysteries, but um, nonfiction writers can branch out more and say, okay, um, I did this subject, Um, maybe I can do something else that interests me. Um, So I think the curiosity is is prime and inquiring mind and and good writing, of course, that's that's universal. Absolutely. And I think a large percentage of us, myself included, have multiple genres of interest. So thank you for setting such a good example. And the fact that it can all be done. It's really great, Edie. (laughs) Well, you know, it, it was at first, it was something that I beat myself up over as so many of us do and say, I should be. And then I I I heard a quote, and I think it was by Elizabeth Gilbert, who said, you know, you don't have to have a passion, you have to have curiosity. And I thought, yes, that's great. You you don't have to tie yourself to one thing. Mm -hmm. You you can love and be interested in many things, and and that's better. Why limit yourself to to one passion? What if it doesn't work out? Um, You know, and then you you feel stuck in that in that particular mode. So I, 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 I thought it was great to be able to say, yes, um, don't, don't put yourself in a box like that. Just branch out and see what interests you at a particular time and take it where it goes. I love that. This has been so helpful. So, and with everything we just discussed, what would be your top tips you want our listeners to take away today? Well, I would say that um, plan, plan, plan. It's it's an important thing to to do. Just um, keep on top of it. Make sure that you've got your dates set and um, not confused. And just be prepared to adjust and be pl- flexible. And just use all the resources that you've got. Um, as I say, don't don't put yourself into a box and say, well, I can't do that because that's not what my book is about. You can do that, and uh, you might get a whole new audience who's interested, and you might get some ideas for, for future things that, that you become interested in as a result. So, um, yeah, be uh, work hard and be creative. That's what, you know, I guess that's, um, that's a takeaway from pretty much everything, right? No, yeah, but it, it's it's a powerful point. It does take work. Um, Edie, this has been so helpful. Yeah, remind our listeners how they can connect with you and any services you offer. Tell us your book titles again. You've got great book titles. Well, my um, my dog book is Am I Boring My Dog and 99 Other Things Every Dog Wishes You Knew. And my my memoir um, is Getting Naked for Money, An Accidental Travel Writer Reveals All. And it's based on the fact that I actually was assigned by 
uh, more magazine to go to a nudist resort and <laughs> or take it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so uh, those books are both on Amazon, and I'm an editor, too, and I've been telling people that this is a perfect time to write your memoir because it's a great time for self-reflection, and I'm I'm just editing a memoir now, and um, I really love editing, too, because I get to... I get to not have to agonize about <laughs> the words I'm putting down on the page and, and see what other people are doing. So, um, and that all of that, uh, you can contact me through edgerolam.com. I think the link should be up on the page. Yes, it is. Edie, thank you so much. What a great guest you've been. We really appreciate your time. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's been great talking to you. Thank you so much for joining us today. We conduct these interviews every week with an archive episode once per month. Find our podcast schedule and replays on the events tab at nonfictionauthorsassociation.com. Or better yet, subscribe to us on YouTube and get notified when the next podcast is available. If you like this episode, please consider giving us a thumbs up and you're always welcome to use the comments to tell us what you liked and what you'd like to hear next. Thank you and see you next time.